steers to the right of the box office or the limited leg. Denmark, the state of happiness will begin in five minutes. Thank you.
Hello everyone and welcome to the Adam Smith Theatre, Beverage Suite, for this show of Denmark, A State of Happiness. If you could um, all make sure you've got a comfortable seat. Uh, we're going to watch a film for about an hour. We're going to have Leslie here um, for the Q&A afterwards and she'll say a little word or two before we start. Fire escapes, there is no fire drill planned for tonight. If the alarm goes off, it's real. So the fire escapes are out that door out this door here, either down the main stairs or keep going when you go out that door. You will see them and uh, I will be part of uh, fire marshal to make sure you get out. So no fires planned, um, no fire drills planned. Lovely to see you all. I hope you enjoy the film. Um, I've seen it myself already, it was wonderful. And Leslie was kind enough to add in an extra show to come and see us in Kirkcaldy, so delighted to have her. Well, uh, it's great to see you. It's also great to say hello to our live stream audience. Uh, come on, make a bit of noise. They're, they're out there. <laughs> Delivered to you by the lads, Gary and Stuart, who've come all the way from Oban tonight, right? And they're going back to Oban tonight. So, you know, if you ever see a, a kind of a, a, a collection for Indie Live, put money in the bucket because this is what these guys do. You know, they just go around making this their business, which is terrific. Um, so this is kind of toward, getting towards the end. There's been 32 screenings of this film. And um, amazingly, they've nearly all been sold out, all except Peter Head. <laughs> Okay, don't, right, anyone from Peterhead, don't take the hump if you're on the, if you're on the live stream. Um, but that's quite astonishing. And it seems to me, as I was saying to some of the lasses there, you know, I mean, you don't know if this film is basically crap. <laughs> and so you're here for another reason. You know, I think people are coming because they basically want to get a sense again of what we're aiming for in Scotland. You know, the kind of country we want to become not in abstract and theory and kind of pernickety points of politics, important to those, as those probably are, but embodied in an actual living country that operates and functions and is really quite close to us. You know, we need reminding that this summit is in view. Um, it's the only way you ever manage to keep plodding up hills. <clears throat> so the, the, the purpose of these films, I've made uh, quite a few, if you haven't seen the rest, they're all on the website, leslieriddick.com slash films. This one will be here, there tomorrow. Um, Norway, Iceland, Faroes, Estonia, one about the Declaration of Our Broth, which is almost very timely as well. Um, and then this one about Denmark. And the point is, is really to say, look, you know, it's not like Scotland is going to be an identical nation to any of those countries. We all have our different pasts. We've got our different stories, assets, geopolitical location, history, you name it. But when you look at that basket of different countries, small countries, that have got all sorts of difficulties facing them, you know, when Norway became independent in 1905, it was the second poorest country in Europe after Portugal. Seems extraordinary now. They didn't come independent to have oil. Nobody knew that was there. They became independent to, to plough plow their own furrow. The Estonians, 1991, when they became independent, they had the worst winter. You know, the old people were eating grass. 1991, that recent. And they turned it around to create the Baltic Tiger economy that basically embraced the digital world and moved on because their leaders were in their 20s. There's a different story with every country, and it shows that in any situation, there's always a better solution once people are basically got control of something themselves. And so Denmark. Well, Denmark's a bit unusual in the sense that Iceland, Norway, and the Faroes have all basically tried to run screaming from Denmark. You know, Denmark hasn't become independent. It's the mother load. Uh, in fact, Denmark owns so much. If, you, if you've watched your last kingdom on the box or the Vikings, you'll know that the, uh, the Danes actually ran England 
from 844 to 1000, from London to Chester. That was Dane law. After that, the Normans came in, clue in the name, Mare Danes. The Danes ran Estonia, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Greenland, Iceland, the Faroes, and Schleswig-Holstein. Um, that was contested with the German Confederation. And in 1864, the Danes made a really pretty ferocious mistake, which was to try and annex those two duchies and uh, the, the guys on the other side, not pleased. And the guys on the other side, led by a chap called Bismarck. <laughs> right, you don't need to remember too much from your history to go Iron Chancellor Denny Mess. <laughs> so the Danes in that year almost lost everything. They almost lost their country. The, the only reason that uh, Bismarck didn't just keep going and basically occupy Denmark and just add it to the German Confederation, just wiping that country from the map, was because the British, the French, and the Russians didn't want to see Bismarck get more land. Now, that's, they lost almost everything. They had it all, and they lost everything. Can you think of another country that's sort of sitting <laughs> with the same dilemma? Because that's the point about this. Uh, what, what the Danes have managed to do is come right back from the precipice without this constant anguish search for past glory, without, you know, without kind of the huffiness that makes you retreat from the continent that you're part of, uh, without you know, the hierarchy, the archaic systems, these guys modernized and moved on. And actually this is a film about independence in the sense that Denmark has managed to keep its own track, to create its own path. And that's extraordinary for a little country in the se sense that it's got the same population as us in a, in a continent of big players. So in a way, this is about independence. It's a different kind of thing. And for those of you who are in the audience who are actually not supporters of independence, and that's okay, um, I just hope you take from it whatever you will. So uh, we're about to have the button pressed. She said, looking at the space beside the button without a finger on it, um, which might rapidly, I mean, I can do it, but uh, I think there's somebody who's kind of, uh, right, you, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, friend. Right, okay, um, I can move this. And uh, I hope you enjoy it, we'll be back at the other end. Thank you. Denmark, small, successful, and perhaps the country Scotland most seeks to emulate, leading the green transition with the world's second most livable city, the most contented workforce, and Europe's shortest working hours. But its people pay some of the highest personal taxes. So what makes the Danes so happy? A lot of people ask, is there a model? Can we scale this? And this is, mm, I don't think so. Let's go. I pay about 37% uh, of my income in taxes. If you don't pay that much in tax, you're not able to uh, have this welfare state, and then so you see it's all interconnected. We're not allowed to do exams, exactly, and we're not allowed to give grades. So that is a very unique uh, possibility for us to teach in a way that nobody is controlling how we do it.
Copenhagen, the world's most sustainable capital. But like everything in Denmark, that happened not by accident, but by design. In the 1980s, the city was close to bankruptcy, with heavy industry in decline, a falling population, falling tax income, and a dirty, polluted river. The challenge was to bring young families back, so the council asked how and got a surprising reply. Swimming right here in the centre of the city. And uh, as luck would have it, um, my colleague, Tina Sobby is here. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> You're here, right in the water. I know. How astonishing that we are here together. <laughs> so tell me, you were the city architect here for 10 years and helped, well, saw a lot of changes. When did they start swimming here in the harbour? It began around the year 2000, 2002. We had the first swimming bath. I guess it was in 2000. And just how much did you have to clean the water? Because it must have been horrible. <laughs> Quite a lot. So there was a lot of pipes that was going directly into the water and we needed to, to change them. That's putting it mildly. A new sewage system was installed with a runoff to make sure rainwater didn't cause overflows and the harbour sediment was cleaned. It cost hundreds of millions of pounds 40 years ago, but it was worth it. The harbour was splitting the city in two. Nobody was coming down to the harbour because it was an industrial area and it was dark and it was gated and yeah so it was not it was not a place you came and today the harbour you can see is almost binding together uh, the Copenhagen. Elsewhere a newly restored waterfront would be full of upmarket flats and private piers but not here with planners determined to protect public access. We have a planning system where we have been putting uh, some guidelines and regulation so all the area is with public access. So a lot of the land is privately owned but, you, but it is with public access. And I guess um, the solution that people can walk and bike along the harbour is also one of the reasons that we want to go here. Have you managed to keep the population in? Have you got more families that are living and not going off to a smaller suburb? When you just look around here, there is young people, that is, there is families, kids, uh, babies, and there is also uh, old people. So I guess we have quite a, a good population here where every generation is, is living in, in the city. But the 80s restoration didn't stop at the river. Housing was improved, and instead of glorified bin parks in back tenements, Copenhageners got lovely designed gardens with rules to guarantee cooperation. You should uh, make it into uh, one community, so you're not allowed to put any fence to privatize it. It should be the rainwater should have its own system, so you were uh, off uh, the big system. There should be no cars, so in a way you can also say it was an early thinking of sustainability. And then the important thing was also that we should maintain it ourselves afterwards. So it was also a democratic way of, of taking care of it. So, so now there is uh, money from every uh, family living here uh, into the maintenance. So there is a, a community maintenance, you can say. A third of homes in Copenhagen are cooperatively owned, and that's helped cap prices. Housing costs are slowly rising, but heating remains relatively cheap. The city's had district heating for a hundred years, and 98% of homes today get high efficiency, low cost heat from 10 central boiler plants. No struggling with individual boilers here. the Danes could imagine and build a heating plant like this. The Amerbaki plant, nicknamed Copen Hill, has an artificial ski slope on the roof. The energy comes from incinerating local rubbish, and that means minimal transport. The only emissions are water vapour, but the city aims to switch to biomass by 2025.
Another design feature that keeps Copenhageners happy is travel. Bikes outnumber cars. Today, 58% of residents travel to work and school by bike using 500 kilometres of bike lanes and car-free bridges. This is one of the great bits of infrastructure that makes cycling the fastest way to get around Copenhagen and the safest, because it's a cycle and uh, pedestrian-only bridge. That's what makes cycling popular, because it's fast, it's quick. I'm joined by Marianne Weinrich, who chairs the Cycling Embassy of Denmark. No anguish stressed expressions on cyclist faces here, generally no helmets. In fact, people don't look like conventional cyclists at all. It's striking to see women like you, you're beautifully dressed. <laughs> yeah, you know. Change into work, you know, cycling gear to get no. messy or mucky. No, so we, we okay. don't dress for the ride, we dress for the destination. Right. Amazingly, in the 1980s, Copenhagen was as car-centred, congested and cycle-unfriendly as many Scottish cities today. But there's been a lot of work to turn that around. We've come to Norapur station in the city centre, redeveloped with a huge bike park. It's big, but already not big enough. Politicians have chosen every year to have budget and investments and build more and more uh, cycle lanes. So it is kind of because it, the people also want it and we have uh, visionary politicians who, you know, makes decisions about this and, and sees this as part of mobility in Copenhagen. You're so relaxed here about cycling because you've built in the safety through the design of the Copenhagen lanes. Safety is part of the design. It's not necessarily something you wear. Um, and protected bike lanes is kind of the, the Copenhagen, the Danish uh, design standard. And that means that uh, there is a uh, pedestrian area and there's a curb a physical separation that also separates pedestrians from cyclists. And then we have the bike lane and then there's a curb that again physically separates the moving cars from the cyclist. And that physical barrier is key because if it's just a painted lane or something like that that you can cross, it doesn't give the same kind of uh, uh, yeah, a feeling of, of safety and security and also de facto safety and security. Is that a key thing for getting women actually onto bikes? Because that's very noticeable here. Yes. Research has shown that um, the share of women cycling in a city is an indicator for how safe it is to cycle there. Women are generally more averse to risk in life than men. And when it comes to cycling, we simply won't cycle if it's not safe. I would say we're kind of smart that way. <laughs> um, and, and also, when you combine that with the fact that uh, women do 75 of the unpaid care work in the world, and that also means often uh, traveling with, with children, then you need it to be extra safe for you to, to travel uh, with your children. So designing for especially for women and also uh, for children to be able to, to cycle. That is designing, you know, with, with safety in mind. And then being, that's part of normalizing cycling and making it for a much broader group than the younger, more daring and, and strong and fearless. Tour de France uh, cyclists. Yeah. Although you're pretty um, good at that as well. Yeah. <laughs> It's a joined up transport strategy that makes cycling the obvious choice for commuters. There's a dedicated compartment for bikes, not just five places. You don't have to fight for it, it's not bookable, and it's on every commuter train. It's to die for. Leaving Copenhagen behind, I'm off to explore the rest of this island nation, heading for the small town of Skiva in the heart of Jutland. Denmark has roughly the same population as Scotland, but just half the land mass. It wasn't always this way. Denmark once controlled Norway, Sweden, Finland, Iceland and Schleswig-Holstein, lost to Germany in a disastrous war in 1864, after which Denmark almost ceased to exist. 
Yet the Danes rapidly adapted to this huge loss of territory, population and status without acrimony or nostalgia. Instead, the country accepted change and powered back thanks in large part to an education system that's quite unique. Take the next right onto Freelance Line. Well, uh, there is life beyond Copenhagen and the big cities. Uh, this is small town Denmark. It's very different though, it's quiet. There's no pub, there's no shop in this little village, but there are apparently six little groups and societies all funded by the council. So people are active citizens here, just not in the public realm. Larissa Albers is a teacher and mum. She walks her son Felalik to kindergarten every morning. Okay. They start the month before they turn three. Children start primary school not at four or five, but at six in Denmark. And kindergarten is a light touch start. They work with the letters and they work with the numbers and the colours, of course, but it's not a must that you can spell out your own name. Okay. It costs roughly a third of a full-time place in the UK. If you didn't have the kindergarten or any childcare, it would be very hard for you to be a teacher at all. Yes, exactly. I, I have about a 30-minute drive to my work and also 30 minutes back, so I need to go somewhere I can deliver my children and know they are safe and then I can do my job and provide money and provide for my family. Mm -hmm. You need to pick your child up before five mm -hmm. and that's fine. If you don't mind me asking, um, how much tax are you paying and are you happy to pay high tax for these facilities? Yes, I pay about 37% uh, of my income in taxes and I'm really happy and I'm glad I'm doing it because it means I got the kindergarten, I got hospitals and anything. I need provided. Is that the Danish way? Yes, we uh, all help each other so that everybody gets the possibility to go to kindergarten. You also have families who don't have that much money and then by us paying taxes we actually help them getting a cheaper or more discount in the daycare and some of them even go freely to daycare, they don't have to pay. Head teacher Marianne Christensen says the kindergarten encourages children to explore and learn the key skill of cooperation. We have activities that the, the grown-ups uh, are preparing for the, the children all day. Today is, we are really having a good weather, so we are outside. But we can go inside and cut and um, paint and play, and we all have all kinds of uh, toys inside, yeah. Um, do, the, do any of the children have a difficulty with being outside? No, no, not at all, yeah. It's mostly the parents that have their difficulties. They think they are um, hiding and we can't see them, or they're cold, they're wet, but that's not an, an issue at all. What do the children get from being outside all the time? Experience. They have to taste and uh, feel and, yeah, yeah. And they're Social activities uh, skills are very, very good because they have to move and get inside the play. Can I be with you or can I have not? And, and so they're learning to cooperate. Yeah, yeah. Because th this is the Danish way. Yeah. Uh, the Danish way is uh, that children playing is very valuable. Yeah. The kindergarten sets up play and cooperation in education, but that gets reinforced at the age of 15, when many youngsters spend a year away from home in a remarkable Danish invention, the Efterskola. They still do core academic subjects, but also learn something they truly love. This Efterskola specialises in diving, swimming and sailing. There's a holiday today, but normally 170 15-year-olds from all over Denmark are learning, living, cooking and diving together. Principal teacher Yannick Marshall says after school are about far more than just hitting academic grades. 
I think it's important that, that we take some of the, the pressure off, take some of the of the the, the, the tempo out of uh, getting uh, through to college and getting through to, to, to our work. And I think that's too much. We have to stay right now in, 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 in this age, 15, 16, and, and look at each other, but also look inside and say, who am I? Uh, what do I want to do with my life? Um, I can see you living a different life from the one I've lived. That's interesting. Tell me more. Um, so, so this this whole balance uh, as a as a big um, That's 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 after school. Students share domestic chores, and for most of these 15-year-olds, it's their first time living away from home. And they sit in the dining room in the in the family. All oh, right. So it kind of makes it more manageable rather yeah. than being 170 yeah. people. Yeah. And yeah. then each family has a, a teacher. That's their mentor or closest relation to mm -hmm. to home and home that's a very important role to be because life hurts sometimes yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the young people who come here are learning how to cooperate create a community and become active citizens i think we're, uh, we're happy but we're also very self-focused um, and we try to use this year to show that now now you're part of a, of a fellowship and um, this is the strength of a fellowship. You give and you take. And some give more because their wider shoulders right now are being a better place in life. And then you give more to, to, to the community uh, and then they get, you get back. So you, there's ups and downs in life. Um, the ups and downs this year. Um, so I think that's that's also the, one of the big values of being an unaffected school. What's not to love? But the chance to explore your interests and yourself doesn't end with Efterskola at 15. Danes aged 18 to 99 can also attend folk high schools or folk co-schooler. These residential learning centres, inspired by the Danish thinker Nikolai Grundvig, expand horizons, especially in that year between high school and university. Caroline Spielt Hoogsbro, the principal at Krabbesholm Hoogskola, explains that they recruit passionate practitioners, not conventional teaching staff. We're not allowed to do exams, exactly, and we're not allowed to give grades. So that is a very unique uh, possibility for us to teach in a way that nobody is controlling how we do it. Well, there is obviously some kind of control. We have to teach for some hours, uh, for a certain amount of hours, and it's not like there's no control with the schools at all, but it is the, um, a very clear claim of the school that we should not be a school with a curricul curriculum and no, no exams and no paper. If you ask people who in, in my age, they would say the year in the after school or the year in the high school was the best in my life. So that's something you take with you the rest of your life. Kravis Home is a modern arts-based school in a 500-year-old building with live-in teachers whose role is to encourage and inspire. Teacher Kirsten Pals is here after an international career in visual arts. I'm not trained as a teacher. I, I am trained as a visual artist and I work as a visual artist. And this is also something which is possible in this kind of school, that uh, we can work here without being trained as teachers. But we come here through our knowledge and engagement and passion for the arts. I'm from Oslo, Norway, and I can already see a huge difference in how the education system is between the two countries. Because here it's more for your own sake than doing something for your teacher. So you develop much more skills, and I feel like we're all very motivated to do mm. whatever we're doing in whatever studio or workshop, because it's for your own sake, and you learn so much more than just having a grade and a teacher coming in kind of saying, oh no, don't do that, they kind of guide you. Really? <laughs> I think it's quite normal in Denmark to do a high school. I mean, I clicked a lot more at the time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it's a good I'm 21, and uh, I used to go to uh, gymnasium, and I did two gap years. Um, and I thought that I might want to try to do some art and architecture, so I found this school. The students pay 
for half of the, the fee. And the Danish government believe very much in this kind of school. So they also subsidize high uh, school in Denmark. Because we believe that it, it's, a, it's a larger project uh, making um, good citizenships. So, so the, what, you, what you get with you in this half a year about living together, taking responsibility for each other, being a collective, and um, orienting, or like this personal, also personal development, has such a high value that the Danish government uh, have decided to, to pay for this kind of school. Of course, university still plays an important role in Danish education. Tuition is free and students often qualify for additional living support expenses. It's part of Flex Security, another uniquely Danish take on the welfare state that accounts for more than a third of all government spending. Danes pay an average income tax of about 40%. So what do they get for their money? Free healthcare may sound like the average welfare state, but flex security is different. There are the small things, like parents get a day's pay to stay home with a sick child. And the big things, the Danish pension is truly livable, not one of the worst in the developed world. And unemployment benefit is linked to pay. That's the security part. But unusually, it's also relatively easy to get laid off in Denmark. And that's the flexibility bit. Here at Roskilde University, Professor Jongqvist is an expert in Denmark's welfare policies. We have a flexible labour market, so it's relatively easy for employers to sack people. And that's one of the reasons why we don't have zero-hour uh, contracts. You know, people, employers can take in people if they need more uh, labour and they can sack them if they don't need them. Because there's a high turnover, the economy works well, uh, but it's not borne on the shoulders of the employers or of the unemployed. It's born on all of us, on the society, who collectively finance these unemployment benefits and all the measures that have helped people get back into work. So that's the contract we have, that you're not entitled to a specific job, but you're entitled to a job. And if you don't have a job, then you will get unemployment benefits and active labor market policies and other measures to, uh, trying to get you back into work. And that must be what partly makes Danes happy, yeah. the security. Yeah. Yeah, I've not thought about it that way before. But my friend, the painter, he loses his job two to four times a year. And he's a very happy man because he knows that he will get another job when he's fired. And he knows that in between the two jobs, he will get an unemployment benefit. So he's not uncertain about his income. And his financial institutions are not certain that he will pay his mortgage. So they're also happy to let him keep his house. So, where does the money come from? What fuels an economy that can finance such a generous welfare system? And go! Denmark is now a small country with relatively few natural resources. It's incredible to think that longships like these once crossed the oceans in the Viking era, striking terror into the hearts of people in Scotland, England and Ireland. But although the longships era has passed, the Danish domination of the world seas continues unabated. Maersk is one of the world's biggest shipping companies. And in the 70s, just as the Danish government had a hungry welfare system to feed, Maersk diversified into something new. Henning Morgan is the Maersk company historian. We also went into energy, energy production, formed a consortium called the Danish Underground Consortium and uh, they produced the first Danish oil in 1972. Which is actually ahead of Norway and Scotland. Yes. So you were just quietly first. That developed into a company called Mask Oil. We developed into uh, contractors called, with a company called Mass Drilling, offshore services in mass supply service. So it got engaged in offshore and oil and gas production, which became a significant leg in the mass companies after 1972. It's ironic to be sitting in a country that's a leader in the green transition when you still got a lot of your business in oil. 
We, we did have a, a lot of our business in oil. We have uh, divested uh, basically all of our activities in production of oil and gas by now. Uh, and uh, as a reaction to the green transition, uh, mass supply service is still part of the AP Moller group, uh, but is moving away from offshore services to servicing the, the windmill industry. You pay taxes, and you paid taxes at a time when Denmark was really rolling out its welfare state. Yes, uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, where we had the contract with the Danish state on the production of oil and gas, uh, we paid a lot of taxes, uh, and whether that paid for some of the welfare state, absolutely. Uh, our role today has probably been taken over by other companies because most of our activities, the mask activities, are around the world. This is the uh, office of Mr. A.P. Müller, so the founder of MASK. Right. Um, he died in 1965 and uh, at that time the office was uh, put down and taken away and then re-established here as part of our museum. Your founder had some great sayings and one of them was, if you have the ability, you have the responsibility. So what does that mean? Let me start with the Danish phrase. It's called nyttig virksomhed meaning having a positive impact on society. So if you look at the, many of the sayings of A.P. Müller and his son, Mass McKinney Müller, you'll find this lying underneath what they're saying. We want to have a positive impact on society. And if we have the ability, we also actually have the responsibility to act on that ability. For a small country, Denmark has some huge corporations. Maersk is known all around the world, though it may not quite match Lego as a household name. That pioneering plastic toy launched in 1958. 400 billion pieces have been made since, and that's 50 bricks for everyone on the planet. And the wind industry wouldn't be the same without the innovation of Danish blacksmiths in the 1970s who created the company Vestas. Today, they produce a fifth of all the world's wind turbines on and offshore and sit at the forefront of Denmark's green international image. Danish turbines are powering an international energy revolution, but the underlying infrastructure needs to keep pace. That's where Danish colleges come in. Skiva College trains students from all over Europe in electricity distribution and subsea cabling. Head of Education Kurt Lindholm says they constantly adapt to the latest industry needs. Every year we have an adjustment of what is asked for in knowledge and competence. What are we going to produce of students and knowledge to fit the future? I would say about 80 to 90 percent of our students are somehow linked to the green transition and the future. So I'm from Hull, uh, Kingston upon Hull. Uh, the reason I'm here is uh, I'm a trainee for my uh, company called Swire Energy uh, Renewable Energy Services, and uh, we're here for a training to get qualified to a 66 kV training. We have people from Poland, Great Britain, Portugal on a uh, commercial training because the, the green transition is global. And we provide some specific skills and some specific training that are, are needed around the world. So they come here. We are a small country, but we know we are good in engineering and we are good in, in acting. Convert knowledge to action. So we can sell our knowledge, we can sell our products. I think we have uh, realized we cannot uh, we cannot only produce things or components we also need to produce things that can be exported like knowledge well we're leaving the mainland behind and heading to the tiny island of Samso Normally people think that the big advances, the pioneers, the go-getters are all in cities, but this little island rather proves differently. They were the UN climate champions at the COP26 summit and they're likely to be net zero before the rest of Denmark and Europe. Nine miles off the Jutland coast, the island of Samso has less than 4,000 inhabitants 
and it's less than a third of Arran in size. It's a low-lying farming community and a popular holiday destination, not so different to many islands around Scotland. This metal is part of a system that pretty much no Scottish island has, which is a big subsea connector that takes all the surplus energy in Samso for sale on the mainland of Denmark. And that's exactly the opposite direction of travel that it used to be when the cable came in in 1960. Agriculture is at the heart of the island economy, with small farms producing cereal crops and vegetables, typically Danish, they trust that the tourists will pay. In 1998, Samso Council won a Danish government competition to become a model community for the green transition. Now an energy academy is generating and passing on skills and knowledge. Its champion is a vegetable farmer turned energy guru, Soren Hermansen, who has the human nous needed to bring canny islanders on board, folk who wouldn't accept change simply for change's sake. The whole concept of being green is actually also in my, my, my perspective, not what we aim to be. For us, I think it's kind of how to maintain a healthy society is maybe the most important reason for people to accept changes. If we can change things to the better, and the better is not for me to decide, it's not environment, it's not energy or wind turbines, but the wind turbines can be tools to achieve what you want to change or what, where you want to make a better quality of your life in a, in a social concept. And I think that is what we have kind of been sniffing around to find these connections, this glue of society where we can say, where does it make sense? And then wind turbines was one answer and using bio, uh, biomass instead of imported oil was another one. I mean, every time we had to evaluate it, does it, does it tick all the boxes? Is it cheaper? Is it better? Is it local? Does it produce jobs? Which was all the answers uh, that we had on the other side. I think that is basically kind of our recipe. And a lot of people ask, is there a model? Can we scale this? And it's, mm, I don't think so. It's not scalable, but it's, but it's inspirational. There's nothing new about wind power in Denmark, but getting the islanders to accept a new generation of towers in the landscape took careful negotiation. While farmers like Jorgen could see the money in wind, that didn't impress all of the neighbours. We get a licence here because we have a good air, air here. It's a long way to church, that's the point one. <laughs> oh, OK. So if, if there was a church here, that would be a problem? Maybe. No, it was hopeless. Oh. To avoid kind of the conflict between farmers and neighbors, we, we had a, an agreement with the farmers that they would let land, lease land to a co-op. And the co-op was already existing and they could then have two turbines. Or we didn't know how many, but we asked people to sign up and, and show up and say, I'd like to buy a share in a wind turbine. Not to silence them, but to give them an opportunity to be co-owners. Because the co-ownership makes people much more aware of why it's, it's there. Well, because it's money in the pocket for one reason, but it's also like you are part of a process where you are involved in it both physically and mentally that you, we are doing this, not just a few farmers. And so in two weeks there was 50 farmers that asked for wind turbines on the countryside. Why? Wow. Because it was terrible good business. Everybody could see we could pay it back in uh, six, seven years. And once islanders shared the benefits, few begrudged Jorgen his new wind-based business empire. I have the farming and the energy and now we have uh, built uh, 20 flat for older people. So now I have uh, three legs. Three legs, right. Yeah. Okay, not just one farming leg. Yeah. You have a farming leg, an energy leg and a building leg. Yeah. Right, that's quite a lot of legs. Soren's plan also included making the island's villages and towns more energy efficient. They had largely relied on imports of oil, but their own fields were brimming with another potential fuel and there was a looming energy crisis. So then we talked and negotiated with the farmers. They knew what the oil prices were and we said to them, can you provide a 20% cheaper price 
with straw, then I think we can convince most people to connect to district heating because it, this will mean that energy bill will be cheaper per year. So there's a win-win for everybody. That the house owners will have cheaper heat, the farmers will make a living or make a make a, an income from straw where they usually just had to compost it on the field, and we'll produce a number of jobs we didn't have before to dig down the trenches for piping, connecting the houses, taking the oil furnaces out, and putting in heat pumps and so on and so forth. So 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 when we talked about it in that way, we gave kind of a lot of different reasons for people to connect to this and say yes, this is exactly what we're wishing for. You also killed a lot of birds with one stone because when you had the pavements up, you put a lot of stuff down there in, in one go. I mean, <clears throat> when, when, when we're looking at change, a lot of people say, but we also have this problem and that problem and this problem. And then, then we can get stuck in, in a number of problems that piles up. Instead, we try to reverse that and think, to them, how many problems can we solve in one go? So when we do open up the road, then we could talk to the water people and say, what about these old rusty steel pipes? Maybe it's time to change them. All right, that's fine. We'll pay our bit. The electricity people, why don't we take these hanging wires down that every now and again there's a storm or ice or, or they, they also corrode and they fall down and maintenance costs are higher and higher. Put them in the ground in cables and it could be broadband, it could be many different things here. So we talked to everybody and made them commit to this and co-finance the, the installations. So that made everything cheaper. So you are 3,700 people yeah. with one council here. Yeah. Yeah. And that really works. You, you would be, in Scotland, <laughs> there is nothing that small, no. so everything's I mean, huge. Sometimes people always say, oh, it would, it would be much, much better if we are in a, in a bigger municipality because there's also a lot of little things that becomes big problems because we are a small place. But I think in the long run, it, it has a lot of uh, advantages to be a small place where we can actually communicate directly. But I mean, everything has a, has a, has a flip side, but, but, but I think that's true, it is better. Um, to make decisions in a, in a, in a smaller environment where you, where, where you know who to talk to. That very local decision made Jorgen a happy farmer. Islanders too. 80% now have district heating and their bills were cut during the cost of living crisis when UK bills trebled. Samso has four district heating boiler plants. Bales from local farms are loaded on a slow conveyor belt that inches the straw into a high efficiency burner. The furnace heats water and the water is piped in the streets to heat local homes, with ash returned to the fields. In here I see a whole lot of straw bales that's kind of like a bit of a straw shed. You see on the other hand... This is not just the hay barn. <laughs> this, this is a, a bank uh, deposit uh, for energy. The great thing about this is that all your materials basically are so local. I mean, this facility has contracts with five, six farmers who are not more than three to five kilometers away from this facility. And we have the same with the other facilities also. So we don't spend kind of the saved carbon emission in transporting long distances and big trucks and tractors driving uh, on the roads for long distances. And then the other thing is, if anything goes wrong, the machinery is simple enough that a local person can fix it. This is not high tech, so yes, we can call the plumber and he'll come and fix almost everything here uh, with his own tools and his own capacity. The only variable factor is weather. Late season rain has delayed the harvest this year. So as I leave Samso, the farmers are still in the fields. It's clear that going green has brought jobs, security and cheaper energy and that's made the whole community very happy. Back in Copenhagen, I'm heading to the heart of Danish democracy. How have these progressive policies survived the coming and going of governments over 50 years? The 
TV series Borgen brought Denmark's coalition politics into living rooms across the world with its female prime minister hatching deals in these very cloisters. And that's because Denmark's proportional parliament demands negotiation. Unlike the Westminster system with its first past the post and winner takes all. Hvis ikke vi kommer med et konkret tilbud, han kan forholde sig til, så lugter han blod. Det giver mig ikke på integration, uanset hvad. De får finans, justits og udenrigsminister og seks andre, så tager vi økonomi og erhverv, undervisning og kultur. Borgen's dramatic film location is nowhere near the actual seat of government. That business is conducted across the river in less striking, if more practical, modern settings, like the foreign ministry. Dan Jorgensen is the Minister for Climate, Energy and Utilities. Most people would have watched Borgen and thought that, OK, that's brilliant, it's impressive, but it's a drama. It is actually for real because your parliament, your governments, are invariably coalitions between many parties, and that's normal because you've got a proportional parliament. Well, not only are they coalitions, very often they will also be minority governments. So you'll be in governments, but you won't actually have the majority. Uh, yourself, you, you're dependent on other parties to support you. And this makes it almost impossible for political parties to just go strictly for their own agenda. Also, um, very often, even if you have a majority, for instance, right now we have a majority government, we don't actually use that uh, majority very often. Uh, we almost always seek to have other parties uh, on board for several reasons. One is, okay, so if power changes, we are pretty sure that the decisions that we've made will stand. That's an important reason. But also, actually, it's a part of Danish culture, that political culture, that uh, broad majorities and broad compromises are seen as a good in itself. Now, if you ask most Danish people, they would probably tell you that they think that we have a lot of political differences in Denmark. but which we also do on, 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 on some issues, but, but if you compare it to almost all other countries, the things that we are arguing about in the Danish parliament are quite small differences. So, for instance, we have this tax-funded welfare state, and there's actually no parties in the Danish parliament that wants to fundamentally change that. I must say, in the time that we've been here, we can really see that just in every sort of small way, people are very relaxed, it's very consensual, there's not much conflict about. Well, this is also something that you can see in the United Nations uh, Happiness Index. We are almost always on top of that, that index. And I think, again, obviously for idealistic reasons, you want your people of a country to be happy. But also for rational reasons, I mean, a happy country is a country that's less sick, that's more productive that's got less conflict. There's so many positive things to say about that. And of course, it's all a circle because if you're not happy and you don't have a lot of trust, uh, social capital in society, then you're not able or willing to pay that much in tax. And if you don't pay that much in tax, you're not able to uh, have this welfare state. And then, so you see, it's all interconnected. In the 1970s, a big decision happened when the oil crisis happened, the OPEC crisis happened, all the oil and gas prices in the world went up, but Denmark did something really quite extraordinary afterwards, which was? Well, we decided that it wasn't a good idea to be dependent on energy sources from other countries. So basically, uh, instead of being dependent on, uh, on oil uh, from uh, countries that could, like this, uh, decide to raise the prices and thereby hurt our economy, we needed alternatives. And that's actually how we started developing uh, renewable energy. So at that time, it's strange to think about it now, but at that time it didn't really have anything to do with the environment. Uh, it wasn't a green movement as such. It then quickly evolved to that because uh, many of the very active forces in the Danish society that wanted to make this happen were also interested in the environment, so it went hand in hand, but actually that's how it started. So really it was about protecting your independence as a country, really? Yeah, it was. Instead of buying your energy very expensively from other countries and thereby also being dependent on them, 
it was much better to create your own energy. But then you also decided to keep the price of oil and gas high in Denmark, and you made the cost of importing cars really, really expensive. Yes. Who votes for parties like that? <laughs> Well, we decided uh, decades ago that maybe it's a good idea uh, if you want a welfare state that, ex that is expensive, so you need a lot of tax revenue. Maybe it's then a good idea to tax the things that's a good idea to tax because you also want to limit it. Uh, because then you'd get two things. You'll get the revenue from the taxes, but you will also get less pollution. Uh, having said that, I, I would lie if I said that it's very popular to tax uh, cars. Uh, it isn't. But on the other hand, uh, I think most people in Denmark sort of just accept it because they know, one, we need to do it because of the environment and the climate. And two, if we didn't tax that, if we didn't tax the cars, we would need the money from somewhere else and we would have to tax something different. Coming back to the question of climate, Denmark is still is now right at the front of the green transition, having created the grouping beyond oil and gas at the COP26 summit actually in Glasgow. Um, what are your immediate aims and how confident are you you're going to get there? Well, we've decided to stop our oil and gas uh, production. When we made the decision, we were the biggest oil producer in the EU, so, so we did, even though we also uh, had a lot of renewables already uh, then, uh, we still also had oil and gas, and we still do have oil and gas today. But we decided that if we want to fight climate change, it's not enough to be leading in renewable energy, so that's really the demand side of, of um, of the energy uh, question. We also needed to be leaders on the supply side. So it would have been a bit of a paradox if in the future we would be 100% green in Denmark, but we, we would still withdraw oil and gas and sell it to others. Mm -hmm. So we would just export the problem. That, that would not be a good idea. So we decided to stop all um, future licensing rounds and put an end date in 2050. Now for this to, to actually happen, which it will, uh, of course, we then need alternatives, so this means that we also had to spark and our innovation and be even more ambitious on, uh, on renewables, and that is what we're doing. But life's not perfect. Denmark's refugee policy has international critics. Its proportional parliament means far-right parties are represented and very visible. And a controversial new law limits the proportion of non-Western people in certain neighbourhoods to aid integration. But though Denmark has many of the same problems facing Britain, it tends to approach them with an instinctive solidarity. Oli Dahl is a regional newspaper editor and was a political correspondent in Copenhagen. The age for when you can leave your job is, is going up because we want people to stay a little longer working. So retirement age. Retirement age, yes, yeah, that's going up slightly uh, all the time, actually. Uh, 67 now, but it will go up to maybe 69 in a, in a couple of years. So, so uh, but we accept that we have to maybe be hard working to have the money for the, the, the welfare system, the, the social system we have to make sure that everyone has uh, the possibility of a, of a, of a good life. The biggest problem is now to have enough people uh, uh, to fill out the, 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 the jobs which is not occupied at the moment. Meaning both the welfare system and the education system and the private companies could use a lot more staff at the moment. Many, many places also here locally. So we just hope for, for uh, except, uh, for instance, the Ukrainians have very easy, refugees from Ukraine have very easily found job here and we're happy about that. Uh, but we also need, you know, the young people when they finish school, uh, more of them to stay in this area instead of moving to Copenhagen, uh, for instance. We need them here to, to fulfill the, the job uh, applies that are here. Issues you might find in any Scottish paper. In fact, Ola is a regular visitor to Scotland and sees strong similarities with Denmark. In many ways, you know, Scotland and Nordic countries are so similar, I think, when it comes to life and priorities in life, that I hope also uh, that this cooperation could even be stronger between Scotland especially and the Nordic countries. 
Denmark is now a small but perfectly formed country. The astonishing thing about the Nordic countries is that there are so many small countries working together, but nobody seems to think you should all have the same currency. Mm. All of you have a different currency from each from the neighbour, mm. and you're not a United States of Scandinavia, no, and you right. you never will be, will no. you? One one state? No, no, never. No, never. no, no, no. We like to have this. Uh, independence as we have, the, the, the Scandinavian countries, and, and it works very well. We cooperate and uh, we let the, the people and the countries flourish in their own way and, and in a way which, where they have their strengths, they can show it and still have a, a good strong cooperation because that's needed of course when, when we have a challenge in the world. Europe should stick together as far as I can see it and the Nordic countries and maybe also Scotland could, could be part of of that cooperation to, to you know stick together and work together and Scotland but of course we'd like to see uh, Scotland back in Europe someday. I've got one more trip in my journey of discovery. I'm traveling east from Copenhagen to test the ease of movement between Denmark and her nearest foreign neighbor Sweden. Very easy as it turns out. The famous Orison Bridge between Denmark and Sweden, a frictionless border between two different countries with different systems, different languages and different currencies. Does that get in the way of cross-border trade? Not when you pay by card. Which country are we in? Sweden. Yeah, just so close to Denmark and no bother. <coughs> Paying here? Yeah. Do you want your receipt? Tap. Just like that. So this is Denmark. It's known for its green energy and happy people. But its biggest achievement threaded through my journey and across the lifespan of every Dane is cooperation. It's built into the kindergarten and unique Efterskola, the district heating that powers communities, and the coalition parliament that can stick to an anti-oil strategy for 50 years. You can ski on heating systems, swim in docks, and escape your parents at 15, all courtesy of the state. Denmark is relaxed, cooperative and playful, without the stress that bedevils adversarial Britain. Happiness, like beauty, is more than skin deep. No wonder the Danes are laughing. Ask for that. Uh, can, can you? Can you uh, this just doesn't sound very on. Can you hear me? No. Right. Okay. It's a lot of padding up and down the room that's happening. Um, but anyway, do people feel kind of sad, motivated, angry, yes. all the above? Jealous. <laughs> jealous. Yeah. Jealous. Yeah. Jealous. Right. Well, have we got the other mic for the audience somewhere? <laughs> Right, Sandy, can, can you come up the front? I want to hear from these jealous people here. So I do need my friend, but just right behind the top. Right. Oh, yeah. So we're not ready to go yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Can you hear me through this microphone at the moment? Oh, 
Oh, there we are. <laughs> Hickey wicky, as my mum would have said. Uh, right. So have we got that one going? Yes. It is. It will get turned up when we hand it to the person. Right. So why don't you hand it to a jealous person? <laughs> right. The, the, yeah. The jealous lassies, basically. Aye. We were very, very jealous because we, we are both councillors for Fife Council and we were looking at that ski slope on top of that district heating system mm -hmm. and we're building a, what's it called, Westfield? Yeah, the Westfield development, which is, sits in my ward, which is um, waste, energy. waste energy plant, waste energy. So and between Carden Den, Loch Gelly and Benarty. And it's prime, prime for, by God, if I could have one of those, I would love it. Right. And how, how many people will it be serving? Ah, no, those figures haven't actually gone out. It's, 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 a, it's an ongoing project. It's not going to come online until 2026. Right, um, excuse me if I just go and bang my head off something in the corner here. Yeah. Right, because this is what the... F it takes so long. It's glacial speed in right. Fife Council, and we know that. It's taken eight years to build 39 flats at the bottom of Kirkcaldy okay, High right, Street. Okay, right, let's, let's not get ourselves down, too down before we start here. Know. You see, I mean, just, just, just to say a little bit about the district heating thing, mm -hmm. this is just criminal. Yeah. It's criminal, the situation we're in at the moment, because... I mean, every country in Europe, in Northern Europe, in fact, really m most of Europe, is operating on district, if you like, socialised heating. We have and three in five. Right, f fine, but let me just get a wee bit out before I'm not going to manage a heckle every sentence here, lass, or I'll come and... I'll, I'll give you a luger. I don't know if any of you are from Caithness, you could guess what that is. It's got to do with a lug. Anyway... Um, the, the, the point about district heating is the normalness of it everywhere else. And so this isn't, there's five here, there's one there, there's a, you know, it serves 20 people there, that sort of thing. I mean, what we've been missing for a century is socialized heating. And I mean, it's like if I said to you, maybe many of you are living in a sort of urbanized areas, it's like I would say to you, why have you not got your own water borehole? Right, and you sort of think, well, I don't need that because you know we don't have our own individual water borehole. Well, why are we doing this? This is there's a few fair few folk in here I can see are old enough to remember life before Thatcher, and before she privatised the hell out of everything, she cha she changed people's conceptions of what things would be done essentially as a public service collectively. So we've all forgotten that heat and, and energy used to be a collective thing. Sadly, we weren't onto district heating. And I mean, what that is, is instead of there will be as many boilers as there are people in this room, which is crazy, because if I'm trying to persuade you to upgrade or to change your system, I've got all of you to persuade to put more metal or whatever into the ground. If you were living in any other country in Northern Europe, I wouldn't have to persuade you of that because you'd all be part of a pipe system. You know, many pipes, one boiler. When you want to change, like they're gonna change Amarbaki, they have one change of Amarbaki. That's supplying a 10th of Copenhagen, one plant. So, you know, we've got to change our thinking on this because we're leaving everyone to sink and swim themselves. And we'll also be forever behind the curve because you won't want to put 20, in 20 years time, your kids or whoever gets your house is not going to want to pay to upgrade it again. They'll have to. This is the gravy train we're on of everybody being stung individually for heating when we've got companies and businesses out there who are also paying good money to get rid of hot water. It's madness. And one of the reasons, while we're at it, I think that we don't pick this up is because we have humongous local authorities. If you were in somewhere like Samso, which has 4,000 people, you can spot the possible synergies. I mean, back in the day, in, in 1931, Fife had 81 councils. Now we're sitting with 175,000 people in one local council, right? And this is not to get at anybody, but just 
to just state the ludicrousness of it, um, if you were to look at, that's the Scottish average. The Scottish average for a local council is 175,000 people. The, the average across the EU is 10,000 people. Um, the Norwegians, to take another country, um, have about 400 councils. We have 32. They have, as a result of that, uh, same population, about one in 88 Norwegians stands for election. In Scotland, it's one in 2,071. I mean, we, we're flaring us off the system because we've lost local. And actually, we're local. So it's kind of we're losing us out of the system. And that's another big difference with all the Nordic countries, actually, is the lack of that really... I mean, Kirkcaldy would have its own council in any other country in the world, actually, except Britain and Scotland. We're worse than England. Sorry, folks. <laughs> These are the toughies, right? So all of this that you see, looking longingly at it, it sits on a different kind of system, and it's one that presumes people are capable. So it presumes you want to get power out and just let people make their own minds up because they're no daft. And I don't think that we operate that way. We're very top down. We're very feudal, not just in land ownership because we only just got out of that, but feudal up here where people basically don't believe that the average Joe and Josephine is capable of running something. Um, and so there's all sorts of systems. You know, one of the things that really strikes me, having seen that film many times, is that, that the Danes are bristling with energy. Can you see it in them? When they talk about, obviously, they talk about cooperation, and that's a really, really strong thing. But they also talk about action. They talk about acting. And, and actually, that comes from the education system. Because the, the guy that's mentioned there, that guy, Nikolai Grundvig, 1783 to 1872, roughly, um, he was a Lutheran pastor and very influential in creating these amazing school systems. And the object of all of that was to create active citizens. It wasn't necessarily to do the three R's. I mean, yeah, that's fine if that happens. But it was to create people who were confident enough to speak that old one. <laughs> um, and that's, that's really the, the fundament of how that operates. And sometimes I think, what is the difference between you know, the Lutheran system and the Presbyterian one? My, my mum came from Wick and was a bit, bit of a Presbyterian and had that phrase lots of people would have, which is, many hands make light work. Uh, I saw that translated in Den Den Denmark as many willing hands make light work. And I thought, Right. Um, there's a quality of being telt in Scotland that hasn't left us. <laughs> and actually, what Denmark's trying to do, I think, is create a society of willingness so that you don't have folk by the lug. You basically are trying to get people to come forward to, to just take responsibility. And you don't do that by having kind of pretty speeches. You have that by building in cooperation from the age of three, and then the age of 15, and then the age of 19, and then you keep doing it. Your, your, your government builds it in. Your industrial relations build it in. You keep building it in, because if you don't, you end up with us. <laughs> you know, well-meaning, but still stuck in an adversarial system. That was a long answer to a short point. Yeah. Leslie, on the subject of schools, I was particularly impressed with the, the setup they have. The young mother that we spoke to had said that she gives 37% of her earnings towards the state. But then she went on to say, or it was the woman who was running the school, went on to say that there is some kind of subsidy that's given to those who can't afford and it becomes greater and greater to the point where I think actually she said at one point there was even, it got to the stage where it was free. Now, how does that work? How is that, does that come from what is paid in by those who are earning? Or how, is it a, is it a point system? It's just, it's just not that complicated. No. It's a state okay. service. Right. You but know, how, so, I mean, honestly, right, okay. I think only we would find this yeah. hard to 
<laughs> understand? No, no, no. I mean, it's the same way as if you're talking about any other part of education. Mm -hmm. It's a free service, you know. So, so it's what we do. So the point about kindergarten, most... Um, I'm kind of more aware of how it works in Norway, but I think it's very similar in all the Nordic countries. Um, in Norway, you, can't, you cannot spend more than £200 a month for a full-time place. Okay. Right. You're all so looking at me like... For, so our 11, 40 hours... You guys are some... For three difficult. and four year olds are 11, four, three, 1140 hours. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I'm never aware of when you're about to speak, so I'm not listening. Our free, our free, free childcare for our three and four year olds of 1140 hours a year, which is what mums can get now, is definitely helping those those who are. They also, there is also space for two year olds, free spaces for two year olds as well at nursery here yeah. in Scotland. So I, I appreciate that. Obviously, what they're talking about is a system that goes from the age of, you know, three to six. No more questions asked, universal, right? So I'm not knocking anything. Obviously, we're slowly getting somewhere here, and, and happily, at most events, there'll be somebody who actually works in an outdoor kindergarten that's actually got very used to that. And that's good, there we are, it's here, here again, that's tremendous. Um, these are not the exceptions, and there's nothing kind of stunning people particularly, Although you'd have to say, it's funny, every audience, when they see that bit where the saw is about two inches away from the little fingers, you know, um, everybody's kind of freaking out a bit. But, the, you know, the object of a lot of these kindergarten is to absolutely, when she, when she asks, I ask her that question, what do the kids get? And she says, experience. Then you've got to ask yourself, so this is just... Switched off, Sandy. Strangely, when you stood up, it just. Yeah. I can just switch my. Just... <clears throat> right. Um. Yeah. Uh, so where were we? Yes, experience. So you know the point is what what you're not getting then if you keep kids cooked up is they are not getting experience. So let's go back to that thing about their confidence to act. You, you get the confidence to act by experience. And that bit about the social skills, I often wish Charlie had just left the last frame in. You know, there's the bit where the wee laddie is kind of trying to play with that thing, you know, that's, and he kind of dunces he a wee bit. I mean, in the next frame, one of the larger kids comes and curries him and kind of comforts him. And the thing is, that's better than an adult intervening because it's the same thing. I, I mean, I've been at, I'm sure that this is true of your kindergarten, but uh, the ones that I've been at, the outdoor kindergartens that pa pioneered all this in Norway, I, I was actually there when a bairn fell off a climbing frame and I was almost up automatically and the woman running it just put her hand on my shoulder and said, just watch this. And actually the older bairns came and dealt with, took care of the wee one. And that's what you're trying to get. You're trying to get everyone to take responsibility for one another as early as possible. Um, so we, we've got some examples of that now, but this is standard everywhere. And you know, people understand the usefulness of it because this, the, the last that was speaking, who said, look, I'm happy to pay 37% if that means that some folk who are poorer can get in free. And I mean, what she's basically saying is, childcare is just, it's essential because it's creating active citizens. You know, our mission as a country is to be active citizens, to be up and at it. And we can't do it if everyone hasn't had the chance to go through this experience. So that there's some beautiful little observations, I think, in there where people so understand the, the purpose of, being, of collective action. It's like it's being restated all over again. We know, you know, I think most Scots would be right there with it. But these are folk who, would, who understand why you need a welfare state. Anyway, do we have another microphone or not that works? Where, where is it? Okay, Sandy is not here for the minute. Right, okay. Uh, and I know it's frustrating because you can all just shout. The thing is the pe people on the live stream won't hear you. So, yeah, okay, so we'll have to work it like that. So if you could keep it short, thanks. And that leads to trust in your politicians, 
which includes if you have smaller councils, you're more likely to know somebody. You're more likely to trust them and therefore get rid of a lot of the corruption. This is a major problem that I think we can now have in the UK. And it goes back to that. Well, actually, yeah, this is a question about trust, also mentioned about councils. Just because people don't seem to know this very much, um, I mean, the, the period, okay, the period when there were many more councils in Scotland was possibly not a kind of great nirvana. You know, for, if you look at a lot of rural councils, like in the last century, Roxburgh Council down in the borders, uh, for 20 years, the convener of Roxburgh Council was the Duke of Roxburgh, dancer. And for another 20 years, it was his big pal, the Duke of Buccleuch. So basically, these guys, you know, were your, your landowner, your landlord, your employer, your feudal superior, and they ran the council, and we called that local democracy, right? So, you know, because we've got, we've had a history of, of great and good, um, and I'll give you that Fife has had a very different, feistier history thanks to its mining heritage. Um, but across Scotland, it's Apache kind of history. So it's not like anyone's looking back and going, hey, do you remember the warm and fuzzy days when we used to run little councils and they weren't corrupt? There were a lot of brown paper envelopes around. You know, it's true. So when we do this again, we need to flush the system with proper democracy, proper elections, and proper power. And nobody's discussing this at the moment because this is deeply unfashionable. It's 25 years since the Scottish Parliament was established. Um, it was created with a mission to do three things. I keep forgetting what the other two are. One was decentralise Scotland. It has done the opposite. So, you know, that's something we just need to think about. Um, um, I don't know if we've got... Oh, well, right, we're back with a microphone that might work. Yes, the last there. The one that's got her hand up. Thank you. Fine to be called a lass. <laughs> um, I was going to ask, is the childcare and things in, in Denmark and the other Nordic countries, is that also reflected in decent wages for the folk who work in those kindergartens and also at the other end of life in care homes and things? Because that seems to be a huge problem we've got that people aren't valued for providing social services to others yeah. in society. And I mean, w one of the, the, you know, we could have, that little section there is in the film about flex security, I think leaves people going a bit, you know, uh, we could easily have done an hour about that because it's such an unusual system that Denmark has. And you might look at that, I mean, I did and sort of think, really? You know, I mean, we tried hard to find people who had big problems with it, with the idea that you could be laid off quite easily. Uh, admittedly, we didn't spend very long at it, but we didn't find, you know, a, a, a huge issue. One reason, um, the proportion of workers who are members of trade unions in Denmark, 67%. The proportion in Scotland, about 29 to 30%. So actually, the unions are in these systems. And this is another thing, because when you take the adversarialism out of it, Unions are actually happy and wanting to be helping run organisations. Now, I know this is a bit touchy because a lot of unions in Scotland go, no can do, man. You know, you guys are over there, we're over here. You know, ne'er the twain shall meet. But for trade unions, and they've got much, much bigger trade union memberships. Again, just comparing Norway, Norway has two million trade union members. Scotland has half a million we have the same population. So we can either sit like this and keep, you know, I think, I think some union membership's been boosted by the whole period around COVID and sharp practice and yada yada. So that's fine, but still sitting at half a million. So if we wanted to move this on, you could look at those Nordic countries that have just, in the 1930s, made a big decision to just do collective bargaining always have trade unions sitting at the table and running, helping to run things on the basis that shock horror, compromise and cooperation is always better. And actually, you know, we're even seeing this right now because I heard in the news as I was coming in that the doctors, I think, in England have finally settled. Well, what took so long? You know, I mean, it is an achievement of the Scottish government that they have actually had fewer strikes in a lot of these sectors. But 
what, what, what does anybody south of the border, do they think they're looking tough? Do they think they've got a better chance of winning the Tories than winning the election because they hung out and caused tens of thousands of operations to be cancelled just to look like they were in charge when they're not? You know, this adversarialism that's at the heart of everything, I'm not being naive. Obviously, there are different interests in there, but, you know. I just hand it along. Hand it along. Oh, sorry. Thank you. When I was a student, and that was quite a while ago, I visited Denmark. Uh, and that was before the huge changes that you have portrayed this evening. But even then, I was aware of a principle that we pay high taxes, but we get good services. And that felt to be like a country Scotland could be. But the last time that a major party campaigned for government on the basis that high levels of tax produce better services and a better quality of life was over 50 years ago, and they lost. It totally depresses and frustrates me. How do we shift that culture in Britain that we can pretend to provide Nordic services on our levels of taxation? Well, you might know what I'm going to say here. I don't think you can do it in Britain. Um, I mean, I think the goose is cooked, I'm afraid. Uh, the, the kind of belief, I don't know quite what happened to, to English voters. Seriously, don't understand it. They're not stupid people. And they voted for absolutely self-harming propositions on the basis that they would get a couple of shares in something. It's almost like, you know, it's like, I'm trying to think of, what's, what's the, 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 the kind of nursery rhyme? That's it's like Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, but I don't think people are stupid, so I don't know what happened. Strangely, the Scots looked at the same proposition. Take water. There's another story in, in the news tonight. Thames Water, the consortium that owns it, has decided to default on an interest payment. Well, thanks, mate. You know, so basically, Thames Water is now bust. Really? Well, what do you think is going to happen next then, folks? Oh, let's get the taxpayer to come in and sort of like bail them out. And probably south of the border, that'll be produced, uh, you know, as quite a good thing. Because, you know, here we are back to having a nationalised Thames water. This is absolutely crazy for us because we never let our water move out of the public domain in Scotland. You know, we have alone in these islands water in public ownership. And looking at it the other way, England, Wales, and a bit of Northern Ireland, but England and Wales particularly, um, are the only developed countries on earth who privatise their water. Because nobody in their right minds would hand the most essential quality for life to the private sector. Nobody, not even the Americans, have privatized their own water system, right? That's how mad that, that was back in the 1980s from Thatcher. So, uh, thanks to Strathclyde Region, which set up a referendum and proved that uh, in a very high turnout, I think it was the 90s, and a very high, we wanted public ownership, probably 90% again, uh, they, they showed that the Scots did not want our three water companies to be privatized. Actually, that was run by a guy called Charlie Gray. Some of you might remember a Labour man from Strathclyde who voted yes in 2014. Because he understood that the only way to protect, to come back to your point, the only way to protect the outlook that the Scots have, which is they totally understand, intuitively understand the, the usefulness of public ownership, the only way to, uh, to, to protect that is with independence. So I'm not holding my breath. There's a horrible set of learnings that are happening down the road for people. I mean, you know, there was that bit in the Oxford-Cambridge boat race when Cambridge, when they won, couldn't do their you know, traditional jump into the river because the E. coli levels are so high. This is what's happened, you know, when you just let private companies rake off profit. And the thing that's utterly <laughs> astonishing is that given Eng England's uh, determination to take back control uh, in Brexit with the horror 
of actually having anybody from the Netherlands, Germany, France, or whatever, having anything to do with the running of, let's face it, England. Who runs and owns the water companies in England? The Netherlands, Germany, and France. It's extraordinary. So the level of self-delusion that's going on, with that's just one resource, right? We could start on any of the other privatized assets. Rail, I mean, I've got to go try, try to go down to London to be on a program, a sky program on, on Sunday morning. There's rail strikes all over the place. You can't buy a ticket because they're all bought up. The country that we thought we were part of where things even vaguely worked has just gone. So I think we need to be able, you need to have a population who understands and gets it. And actually that is the Scots. You know, the levels of trust in, in Scotland between citizens and between citizens and government, Scottish government, are higher than any other in the United Kingdom. Now that is saying relatively hee-haw, I'll give you that, right? Um, it, the, the levels of trust that exist in the Nordic countries are the highest in the world. But you don't get to those higher levels of trust when you don't have the powers to deliver what people want. So we need to have the levers to do the stuff, the things that people are, for example, just take renewable energy. Um, there's no argument in the Scottish Parliament about renewables. Not even the Tories are arguing about it now. In fact, they're cute. Um, you know, sort of Tories, Tory M MSPs, like uh, Jamie, oh, I'm gonna forget his second name, he's in Argyle, Gregor, uh, used to be very, very opposed to wind power until he realized he could make eight million pounds out of putting up wind turbines on his own land. And suddenly he was a massive convert. So the point is nonetheless, for whatever reason, the Scottish Parliament is pretty roughly where the Danes are. They're, and in fact, this is what breaks my heart because Vestas, the company that has a fifth of the world's turbines, that should have been a Scottish company because our wind resource is much better than Denmark's but we were living in a country that just didn't see wind as a, as a proper energy source. Because why would you try to build your own energy when you could be basically helping your pals in BP and Shell to more multi-billion pound profits by taking our North Sea oil and selling it back to us? So I think we've got the fundaments of what we need here in terms of an outlook that Scots don't need a lot of coaching on. Um, and that actually most parties belong to. And there's an important point because what the Danes have, have got with 50 years now since that OPEC crisis is they took a decision and they stuck to it because they had a proportional parliament and they had buy-in. Um, that's what we need because that creates an investable country. Britain is not investable when it comes to many things, but particularly to energy because you can't tell from one week to the next what the policy is going to be. And we all know, we've heard this many times, how much industry likes predictability. Jings. You know, you can't even predict whether Rishi Sunak's gonna try and sell his socks again. I mean, it's just, this is a, a, a hopeless situation, but the Scots are solid. We want renewables, we wanna get on with it. Other questions? Yep. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a bad voice at the moment. You've been talking about the unions from years ago. That was part of the unions years ago. But what happened when Maggie sold the house is we lost all our members because they automatically had a, a, a mortgage to pay. So they never had to strengthen unions anymore. So what we've got at the moment now is all the Scottish people are divided because some have mortgages, some don't. And what also happens is, when you're talking about Denmark, I've worked there, when someone goes idle in Denmark, they get the same money they get when they weren't working. Yeah. So how are we going to protect our people if we can't do that for them? Well, our people don't have strength because if you don't look after the parents, you can't look after the children. As you've heard many, many times, there's parents out there who have children at nurseries have got to do two and three jobs mm -hmm. to try and pay for it. So I feel that the Scots have lost their way and don't have the energy 
to look at the government, for the government to say, I'm going to look after you when you're not working. Because when you're not working in Scotland, you're dead. Nobody's helping you. And, and whose responsibility, which parliament is in charge of those benefits? Well, I'm a Scotch N NSP, so I'll always blame the English. I, well, don't, I don't call I was, it a British government. I was government. born in Wolverhampton, so I will never blame the English. No, I'm not blaming I the English. Blame, I'll get that right. I asked you which parliament. Well, and the important the, it's point a, it's is... It's English it's parliament. W it's Westminster, right? I don't call it that. I call okay, it the English that's fine. parliament. But on the same breath, before you cut me off here, with me working all over the place, I've never met an Englishman who wanted Scotland to leave the Union. Ever. But I've well, also... Apart from Mike Russell. <laughs> But I've also, I'm talking about working people. I don't think he works, does he? He's a member of parliament. It doesn't work. Uh, anyway. You're determined to make this point, and I'm sorry, I'm just determined that I do not agree with you at all, mate. Well, that, that's good, because that's, what's, that's how you get things done. I don't agree with you, you don't agree with me, and through it, we work together to get it done. No, but what, well, OK, my, my point simply okay. is I have no sort of feelings of despair about the psyche of the Scot, because, you know, the systems that we've been stewed in for the last, you just take your pick, 40, 50 years since Thatcher, longer basically within the British state, a British state that basically tolerated, um, you know, industries and, and investors taking the, the wealth out of this country and investing it in the empire to get higher returns everywhere. That's been the curse of this country. Uh, now, Within that, I think Scots are perfectly able to see that if you're going to set up a system that's a proper welfare state, it, you, you probably want to start casting your net a bit wider than Westminster. And it's, it's amazing that actually Westminster has managed to create this idea that there's nobody anywhere else in the world who's got a welfare state. You know, because we were probably arguably first off the block, We've got that sort of, but my God, if we went anywhere else, we wouldn't ha have this coverage. This is just nonsense. So, I mean, everywhere else has managed to work its thinking through. Let me give you an example. You talked, we talked, somebody talked earlier about, um, about elderly care. And the Swedes actually have probably got the best elderly care in the world. The reason that they moved on that was not just because they're kind of nice people and want to be fair to the elderly, it's because they wanted to keep 50-year-old women in the workforce. They're not stupid. They see what happens. If you have a crap situation where daughters end up feeling obliged to come out of the workforce at the point when they are the most trained, the most able, but they end up having to come out to look after their elderly mum, which is what ends up happening, you've just got a collapse in skills. And if you're serious about skills and not just happy to keep blethering a load of propaganda every election, you've got to make sure that you have a system that works so that women can keep working when they want to. So, you know, that's the different outlook that we can, can build we can, we can actually get help from a lot of these countries because my experience of 11 years trotting around the Nordics is that folk are very, very friendly towards Scotland and are very willing to help. But we need to get to a stage where we're creating a new state and we're not bogged down by the templates of the past. Uh, I'm, I'm going to come to a question very, very quickly, uh, but just before I, I get there, my wife and I lived in England for about nearly 17 years. Uh, we came back uh, six and a half years ago. Uh, we now live in Leaven. I, when we came back, I felt I had returned to a country that had progressed and felt progressive and felt like it was moving forward and keen to move forward. Um, we've got the railway returning to Leaven um, at opening in June. Um, I see lots of positivity around that. There's infrastructure being put in, cycleways, all the positive things, things that, that we'd seen uh, on, on the, the video tonight. I find quite a number of people on social media and other areas just moaning about it, saying, what a waste of money, why are we doing that? Etc. Etc. My question is, how do you currently read the mood of the country? <laughs> um, tired. 
really tired. Um, I mean, I might just be speaking for myself at this point, mind you. <laughs> but, you know, I, but I think this is why people really want to see films like this, to sort of recalibrate the settings and think, no, actually, this is doable. It's, I mean, it's not, this would not be a doddle for us. No, 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 you know. But to be able to name where the, the problem areas are, I think, makes something feel more manageable. Um, so it seems to me people are tired, but my God, I'll say something about the Scots. You know, there is no other country sitting in a theater tonight watching a one-hour documentary about another country. <laughs> The, the Scots are amazing in that, you know, we're quite open to the idea that a lot of the templates that we've got used to are probably pretty crap and are very top down and belong to another era and belong to another class. So if you were going to look at what works, well, you've got plenty of examples. Now, there is a big, there's a gap, absolutely. But the, the appetite for, from people to, to just see something that works and to let that go around their mind is a beautiful thing. And the other thing to say is, uh, folk will, you know, be, <laughs> will say that the yes movement kind of petered out whenever 2014, 2015, you know, you, you name your petering point. Um, I know that's not true. I mean, we're not kind of, you know, it's, it's not got the same velocity right at the moment, which is fair enough because there's no, the opportunities are not so obvious. But I couldn't have put a single one of these events on without somebody who was prepared to be the activist here at Sandy. But right around Scotland, somebody has stood up and put weeks of their, of their own effort in and just believed that this would work. And I mean, you know yourselves, the emotional energy it takes to believe in something better <laughs> is huge, and people are still doing it. So I think people I feel let down by you know the debate that you get stuck in being about pretty. I'm not even going to go into the hate crime bill, but you know that, for example, I would like to see us arguing about how we're setting. We're using the Scottish National Investment Bank to pump prime a district heating rollout across Scotland called socialised heating, right? Mm -hmm. And I would even like to see us arguing to be able to raise money on taxes for that. And if we get gubbed and got told, no, you guys, your little pretendy parliament can't borrow that much, we're going to have to make that public. I don't think it probably helped Humza's relationship with councils, what happened with the council tax freeze, but councils can borrow. Can we not stick our heads together and come up with something? I mean, we need to act. I want to see action. And that's where I think people's batteries are getting drained because you're having to imagine what might happen if too much. You know, you need to see some tangible achievements and then begin to realize we can motor on this because we can. The people that make that most clear to me were the people on a little island called Egg. Uh, I was a trustee of the buyout there. It's 25 years ago now. Uh, those guys seriously would not say boo to a goose at one point because they were beaten. And slowly they got it back together again. I can hardly believe these are the same people when I meet them. They're my friends. Uh, they are the same people, but they have now got, because they own the land and they have that security, that every time there's a good idea, they do it. <laughs> they don't wait for someone to case it. They don't wait for a scoping study. They don't wait for somebody else to tell them, you know, whether well, there's a health and safety, you know, whatever. They get on with stuff. And we need this. This is what we need. We need action. So let's just, let's just take another couple of questions. I'm very conscious that apart from the women I so unfairly called the jealous heckling corner, um, we haven't had women ask... <laughs> We haven't had women asking questions. So is there any other women in the audience want to ask questions after this gentleman? On you go. No, you go for it. Yeah. This is a kind of would you agree question. Um, I see Scotland as a very wealthy country indeed in terms of resources, power, people, everything that we've got going for us. The only thing that we don't have going for us right now is a central bank. With a central bank, would you agree 
that um, we could fund every single little institution and bits and pieces that we need to move forward to a, a Scandic dream, a Scandic sort of country. Central bank, is that, solu is that, solu is that the solution? No. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not the solution, right? I mean, it strikes me it's a bit, you know, it's a bit like any vehicle. It goes as fast or as slow, it's as well driven or as badly driven as your confidence. And what worries me about the Scots, I mean, you're absolutely right, you graft on something that's able to, in an independent country, print money the same way as, you know, the magic money tree works down the road. You've got to be careful about that, but still, that's true. Um, we need to get to the stage where we have a, 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 a population who are confident enough that we have good resources, that we have a future, that we have everything that we need in this country, that our taxes are actually our taxes before they go away off and get given back to us, not something out of the generosity of spirit of you know, MPs in London. I, I, I wonder if we're actually confident enough to use those roller skates well. Because I think at the moment, we're a bit worried about falling all the time. And you don't, I don't know if you're a roller skate kid. I was rubbish. You know, I kept, my mum's told me, if you fall and land on the base of your spine, you'll paralyze yourself permanently. Funnily enough, I wasn't very confident on skates after that, right? <laughs> um, and I think we've got this. We're not managing to lance the boil well enough. And I honestly think a lot of this is it needs lots of investment in small projects everywhere. I mean, at council level, what you're talking about there, the small district heating systems, you know, all these things need to start giving people a bit of confidence. And we're going to have to take some of this as well as people, because it's amazing what actually coming forward out of all that doubt does when there's a project that can just harness your ability. Um, so I don't think it's, that's all it is. You know, the, the, the vehicle will be important. But we basically need people who want to drive a bit like Sterling Moss, she said, showing her age. Um, or something a bit more vigorous than we are at the moment. Because I notice in all the events I've done, there are no questions about the green transition. There are no questions about district heating when we haven't got the heckling jealous lassies, right? The councillors, right? And the point is, most of the questions are about childcare and education because we understand that. We understand bairns, we have bairns, we have education. You can map your mind onto that. By gum do we need to motor, folks. We need to be able to map our minds onto much bigger things here. You know, in, onto the energy future, onto all sorts of things. Well, I, I, I mean, I should say we've got to stop soon. I have a, written a book that's got a lot of these ideas in it, Thrive, that's there. And I've got to say that it actually says practically in the first page that it is not looking at questions about currency. It is very much looking at this question of where the confidence of Scots lies. Now, that's not to say that having a currency straight off is not very important for Scotland as an independent country. It's not to say that. It's that I don't want two or three of you who are confident about it on this thing. I want everybody to basically understand what this is about and want the power that comes with that currency. At the moment, it's a bit like having a big kind of powerful dog on a lead. You're just scared to let it off in case you wonder what will happen. We've got to get to the stage where we want to have power in Scotland in our hands, not in the hands. This is not to, to be nippy about anybody that's working at, at Holyrood. There is no other country as centralised as Scotland. As long as we think we're mediating our desires through a 129 people in Edinburgh, we will stay forever modeling passivity. And what all these other countries have done is the opposite. Because they have had all these little councils where they run their town, and they've done it for hundreds of years, because they also never had feudalism in the case of Norway, and they have tens of thousands of landowners, they have run their land for hundreds of years. They are modeling independence with every breath 
in their own local lives. So it was easy for them to imagine running a country. And the opposite is happening in Scotland. There's not enough. That's fine, sir. I hear you. That's fine. You can think. You can, you can, you can have that point of view, both of you. I'm really trying to say something larger, and maybe you're not making, you're not getting it. I, right. Does anyone else get what I'm trying to say here? Yeah. Right. So that's fine. It's not to say it's good or bad. It's just that there is going to be much bigger fish to fry. And if you think that central, of course these institutions will be important, but my God, we need to get us in this frame here because otherwise we're holding us back. We're scared of our own shadows. We're scared of underclasses who haven't had jobs for three generations. We're scared of carrying people that we're not sure can switch themselves on. If we still have that, sir, cork it. If we don't realize that we have the capacity to run stuff, how will we ever know that unless we start doing it ourselves? It's as, as Marianne said in that film, experience. Mm. The end. <laughs> so, can I just say cheerio and could you all sort of have a big Kirkcaldy goodbye to the live stream audience? Thanks very much for joining us. Yeah.